Right. Can I say I enjoyed David's um, characteristically uh, elegant and, and thoughtful book, and I think he's uh, done a lot of the spade work for unionists that somebody needed to do, and I'm, I'm glad he's done it. <laughs> it means other people don't have to do it. And what, what I want to do is pick out some of the themes uh, in my own language that he's uh, addressed and then pick up one or two of the things that I think he's, um, he's not uh, yet confronted, which I do think we need to discuss. And the first point I was going to make was, in a sense, the question that Peter asked, because I think David is, unfortunately, one of a vanishing breed of conservative unionists who actually think uh, about the union. I was interested to read a couple of months ago that Nigel Farage regards Michael Gove as his favourite conservative, <laughs> um, which I think kind of says, in a sense, to some extent, where the Conservative Party is in that debate. And David's point about can you really have a debate around unionism for Britain <coughs> without having a positive debate around unionism in the European context, I think is a, a very valid and very difficult one, because it seems to me at the moment you have a conservative-led, forgive me, Jenny, uh, government at Westminster, which is increasingly looking like an English nationalist government that wants to pull the UK out of Europe, and a Scottish nationalist government in Edinburgh that wants to stay in the EU after an independence vote, if that were to happen, and, of course one of its arguments that is starting to run has been that the Conservatives may well pull the UK out of Europe and that that would be threatening for Scotland. So to take a look at David, some of David's themes. One of his key themes, of course, is the end of Westminster sovereignty. And in a sense, I think he's absolutely right to say that that is what is happening. We now have alternative centres of power in the UK. And as Peter said right at the outset, that is not widely understood. There are essentially, to my mind, now three kinds of UK government minister. There are those who are genuinely UK government ministers, i.e. ministers for the whole UK, like the Foreign Secretary and the Defence Secretary. Nobody would argue that their role is not for the whole of the UK. There are then ministers who actually have to deliver either for the whole of the UK or for a part of it, Great Britain, say, uh, like the Secretary of State for Work and Pensions, but have to work through structures that they do not control, but very often develop default models based on English experience, which they have not thought through and have to adjust in the context of uh, the devolved administrations. We could say some more about that. And the third ones are UK ministers who are largely ministers for England uh, and have no wider responsibility in practice. Now, that requires, it seems to me, a cultural shift in the thinking of Westminster uh, politicians about their own roles. I think David's other point, really, is the, and Adam's also touched on this, is that the future of the United Kingdom is too important to be left to the Scots alone, however you have that debate. And clearly, the decision about whether Scotland remains in the UK is a matter for Scots uh, at the end of the day to vote upon. But we require a wider unionist analysis. David has done that. He's articulated a federalist response. I'm not myself entirely persuaded of that analysis. But what I am clear about is that he's right to raise the role of other institutions, the role of the House of Lords potentially in having a, uh, wide, a wider UK role. I think there are other uh, discussions that we need to be thinking about. Are there models along the lines of the British Irish Council which have a role to play in some of these discussions in the future? David also looks at the joint ministerial committee again, we might want to talk about uh, that. Um, and of course, he also then comes out in favour of a convention on the UK constitution, which of course the First Minister uh, has done, has made the case for uh, very strongly. So I agree with uh, the way he has started to articulate some of those things, and I think they are really important issues that need to be gripped before Scotland votes in September next year, and there needs to be a proper UK debate. I don't think David gets to grips with the English question. I think the English question is rising. And I do think, you know, we've heard Ed Miliband talk about the need for a positive outward-looking vision of Englishness. John Crudus, who's directing the Labour Policy Review, has been very uh, much engaged with that debate over time. And I think that's a, an important and developing area. And there is a danger, of course, that it is won by default by UKIP. But I think there's one final area where I do think that we all of us, and particularly those with media experience, Peter, have to engage with. And it's what I call not the West Lothian question or the English question, but the Letterman question. I called it in a lecture in, in Cardiff uh, earlier this year. Remember when David Letterman interviewed David Cameron, he said, what's the deal on Wales? Now, I would quite like 
London newspaper editors, uh, UK government ministers, to occasionally think, what's the deal on Wales? Because in a sense, it would indicate a structural shift uh, in, their, in their thinking. I don't think unionism is helped, or the UK is helped, by a media culture which treats England as normative and Wales, Northern Ireland and Scotland as deviant or exotic or just different and troublesome. Uh, and we saw that certainly in my own portfolio areas, uh, area in places such as the debate, debate around tuition fees, uh, around qualifications, and particularly when we had the whole discussion around the English language GCSE, uh, an inability to conceive there might be other ways of doing these things. And in fact, that actually within Wales and Scotland, um, particularly, some of what we're doing is more in, in common with the approach taken in, in mainland Europe uh, than it is, uh, than is the situation uh, in England. So I think finally, therefore, we actually need a UK public sphere, and that is uh, a space in which these issues are debated. The only place where that can really happen at the moment is the BBC. But the BBC has to do more than simply reflect each individual nation back to itself. It needs to do rather more of sharing the experience within different nations across uh, the whole uh, of the UK. So David comes up with a positive approach uh, to unionism, let me say. Um, he is uh, optimistic that it can be done. I'm clear it should be done, but I'm deeply pessimistic that it will be done. Thank you very much indeed. That, that's a splendid start to the discussion. Could I, I just make two observations? Three, actually. One on the, the reflecting back. I think it's, a, it's a, both, not only the BBC, but you know, the mild... Uh, uh, aspect of written media, do believe that if you have a Scottish tradition, that no one has Welsh traditions in the that conventional, sure. um, that's all right, because you're telling the Scots that their news, people in the rest of the country don't have to know it. So I, the, uh, I fought losing battle after losing battle um, post-99 um, on that, in, on the Times, to say actually it's quite interesting to know, and I 100% agree with you on that, and I think, it's a re I'm actually, you're, you're quite right, actually, it's the BBC. On referendum, my own view is possibly the most important referendum, maybe the one held in 2017, if there's a re if there's a Conservative government. I mean, whether it's, it's a Conservative Liberal one, whether that will ever happen, that's another question. Because if you imagine a pullout, that would have far more impact on the structure of the UK than anything else, uh, because the response of the... I, mean, I, I was at a, a conference recently with a very senior official um, in, involved in Welsh Affairs who said, oh, the nightmare scenario is quite simple, um, a pullout vote on Europe because that unravels everything on that. And I just observe on Adam's point, I, I, I was in Washington at the end of the Cold War, and I remember talking to Brent Scowcroft, an um, admirable man, wonderful man, who's advised the elder President Bush, a very wise man, and we were discussing the future shape of Europe, and he said, you know, we really haven't adjusted to the end of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. The <laughs> KNK is still there, and I think <laughs> that's true. Right, now let's open it up. Now, the four points. One, the representational one, very interesting one, on the nature of representation, and particularly the asymmetry between devolution of, of discretion of spending and tax, which I think is an absolutely crucial point. Um, the second one is the levers, you know, the Welsh voices um, around the table. There's still Scottish voices, but there, there really aren't significant Welsh voices. Um, the, the, the third point, very interesting one, which, which we haven't really got onto, is the diversity of England. And I think the, uh, is that there isn't a single English voice. There are many English voices, particularly London versus the rest. Uh, and the final one of, on who, who decides um, the 85%, the asymmetry point there. David, would you like to chip in on, on those? Yeah, I Any think, or all you know, of those four? They're, they're very, all of them, profound questions. Um, I, perhaps I can combine a, a couple of themes. The, uh, I think the economics of all this, or the, the, what's called in the literature sort of fiscal uh, federalism, um, I, mean, I mean, that's been a, a, a big thing in, in, in Western democracies, centralised and federal, uh, uh, having m more decentralised administrative mechanisms, and in federal states having uh, more robust uh, positions on taxing and, and borrowing. And uh, now, now to those that say, you know, that the union at the minute is about the status quo and we don't have very radical options and that uh, uh, the, uh, you know, what's before us is, you know, like take it or leave it in terms of uh, uh, do you want to stay within the union that Scottish people are being offered. Um, and therefore federalism is, is just doesn't have any force behind it because people don't think we need to make the bargain. So, you know, why give it? Um, one of the the, the, the big uh, themes to come out of this year uh, from the unionist side was whether 
uh, the Scots could be placated with full fiscal autonomy. Full fiscal autonomy is one of the most lethal things you can do to the union. And I just, and, and I'm amazed that people don't through the consequences of Scotland saying we would never be a net contributor to the UK. We want fiscal autonomy and, uh, in effect, economic independence. So you cannot have an economic union on that basis. Uh, it would obviously create very stressed financial position in, in Northern Ireland and, and Wales, especially if the English taxpayers, they well, if the Scots have full fiscal autonomy, you want, you know, the, the, the Welsh wanted all this, uh, this power to decide their own affairs, you know, they, 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 they should match that with the responsibility of raising much more of the revenue. Now, I, this is why I think it's very important that we uh, look at the options before us. Some of them are really, in my view, if you're a unionist, quite dangerous. And I see federalism as offering a very expansive uh, uh, basis for a new union, but it does give you parameters as well. So if the Scottish government wants its own policy on aspects of defence and whether there should be a nuclear deterrent, you know, you have to have an independent Scotland, thank you very much. If that's what you want, that's the way you achieve it. If you're part of Britain, then you must accept that it is a British uh, policy and uh, that means, you know, from time to time, if you can actually, you know, as we know in polling, can put these questions to people in Scotland and Wales, sometimes the national mood in those countries will not be in favour of a particular aspect of a UK policy. Well, you know, that's the price of union. And the benefits of union, presumably, you know, more than match that if, uh, if you're a unionist content with the, uh, the position. I do think there's a way of... Um, well, I think it's very important that we see a reform of the House of Lords mm -hmm. on a federal basis, because at the minute, I think one of the weaknesses of the union is that, the, that you know, there are different nuances in terms of foreign policy, defence policy, position on macroeconomic policies uh, and welfare, which do deserve a hearing uh, uh, in, in central government. And, and uh, you, you know, perhaps that should be one of the, I'd, I'd say, you know, the House of Lords should be, the, the, the Chamber of Parliament that uh, is made up uh, with some an element of disproportionate uh, uh, representation, so Scotland and Wales and Northern Ireland have uh, a, a louder voice than they would get just by what their population would justify in terms of representation, and then, you know, as a result, the English one is, it, it, it is dampened a bit. Uh, so I, there are ways of doing this, and I think it's quite important that we think through them. But you know, there's a lot that's going on in this debate that people are you know, very casually talking about without realising what the consequences would be. And that's why I'm saying, you know, this is federalism. This is how it could work in Britain. Whenever you do that, you know, there's a risk of ridicule, because the minute you say, you know, well, this is how it uh, would look, and this is the sort of institutions you'd have, this is how political parties would have to operate, these are the intergovernmental uh, 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 conferences you would need. I even talk about the monarchy. Mm -hmm. um, and, and obviously, when you get as concrete as that, you can be open to ridicule. But, you know, we really need to do some hard thinking. And if finally, right. I've gone on too yeah, long, right. federalism is a bargain. It's not a fixed and final constitutional position. It does set firm parameters, the rule book, as I've called it, but it is a bargain. It is constantly negotiated. And that's why, you know, things like, if we ever had a position where a Welshman or woman could not be Chancellor of the Exchequer or Prime Minister, we're in serious trouble. But should a Scot be Minister for education uh, uh, and uh, you know or health indeed in in way in 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 England uh, and I think that these are the things that will need to be discussed and and we have time to get there but uh, you know the initial step is, is really accepting that federal bargain I've talked too much